Okay, good morning everyone. Today, the following workshop will be about introduction to socket programming in Python. And this workshop will be conducted by Mr. Chang, Ms. Ye, and Mr. Lam. They are all JC students. Okay. So, uh, for this workshop, you will need to have Python 3 installed on your devices. We are working with Python 3.6, but subsequent release versions should work as well. Just a link to the official Python website if anyone wants it. So, before we get into coding, I will just give you a rough overview of what sockets are. In programming, sockets are a form of IPC for cross platform communication and serves as a mechanism of transmission of data between two programs. It is one of the most fundamental technologies of computer network programming and forms the basis of many popular network softwares. There are many applications that make use of socket programming in one way or another, including but not limited to multiplayer online games, such as CSGO and League of Legends, instant messaging apps, such as WeChat and WhatsApp, as well as IoT software systems, such as Alexa and Nest. There are many types of sockets, which uh, can be classified according to their communication properties, including but not limited to reliability, ordering, as well as the prevention of duplication of messages. Just the basic set of socket types, which can be found in the SYS slash socket knowledge file. As well, today we will just be focusing on three sockets. So, stream sockets deliver data using the same transmission control protocol and internet protocol suite used to transmit data over the internet, providing for the bidirectional, reliable, sequence, and unduplicated flow of data without backup boundaries. In the context of stream sockets, each end of the socket is associated with a running program and is uniquely identified by its socket address, which is basically just a combination of the IP address and the port number. The port number identifies the program on that device that is using the socket, while the IP address identifies which device the end of the socket is attached to. Port numbers range from 0 to 65,535. But the first 1024 port numbers are reserved for specific types of programs and should not be used for other purposes. As for the IP address, there is actually two types of IP addresses in use today, IPv4 and IPv6. IPv4 uses a 32-bit address scheme, allowing it to store 2 to the power of 32 IP addresses, while IPv6 uses a 128-bit address scheme. Although IPv6 is the most recent version of the internet protocol, IPv4 is still more widely used as of now. Due to time constraints, we will mainly focusing on IPv4 today. So uh, before we get into it, it's good to know that some IPv4 addresses are reserved for special use and have specific meanings, such as 127.0.0.1, and 0 .0 This is a link of reserved IPv4 addresses for further reading. Chang will now guide you out through the process of creating a basic socket connection. We we'll now learn how to establish a client and server connection. First, create your server.py and client.py files. Secondly, make sure you import socket on both server program and client program. Next, we will want to create a server socket for listening. Next, we want to bind this socket to a local host IP address and a chosen port number. We use the dot listen command to allow the server socket to listen. Next, on the client program, we want to create a client socket. Next, we will allow the client socket to connect to the server socket using its 
RECD and inside the code, uh, one here to four that is the maximum amount of bytes that the chat object can receive. So once you've done that, you can print out the data. Input. So I will. So you can use the dot format function to put the data into the string. Also remember that all, all messages sent across the socket is encoded in byte. So here you want to call dot decode function so that you can decode the message from byte to string. So now that we have done that, let's move on to the i.ui file. So first, again, what I want to do is to import socket. Then we have chat socket, so to socket dot socket. Then other than your chat socket you want to contact dot contact. Then you connect to one two three four zero seven zero four one. Basically the server and the top number of your server. Then one two three four five. Then file to you want to print everything for server. Because the server will input first, so you have to wait for the server input then before we uh, send input to the server. So data refers to chat socket dot dt one two four dot decode so you can decode the screen then you print input server dot format data. Then, so you want to send data back over to the server. So, you want to have the data input to input. Input file. Then, after that, you want to send the data over to the server. So, you call this set socket. Stop. Send off. Data. Stop and code. So now let's run this code. So first you run the server of UI file. Okay. So then we run the client of UI file. This is so that the client of UI file can start to connect to it. So as you can see that we can type client, it's basically for client. And then the server uh, on the client side you will see that the server has sent client. Then you want to send client back, then yes. Yeah. So basically you can cut you can keep saying hi hello and you will drop hi how do you and both they will receive and you can send it back. And so this back box will continue. But what happens is that they don't want to talk to this person. Go away. How do you go away? Uh, you can only close the chat by possibly killing the program. But that is not very programmable. So how do you inform this example uh, item to transfer for free? So what I want to do is to uh, let's say check the client on the server if they input quick, then you will close the connection and get So how do we go about doing that? So let's have a if loop this data refers to quick. Then but also so what are you gonna do? We can use what happens is if the data that you put is equal to skip. So what you want to have is a skip function that initially you put the port. And then so this loop will run while uh quit is not a uh, not for this means it's true. The big confusing right there. So once the data is equal to skip, quit will be true and then this loop will stop right. If the data isn't equals to quick, then you will send the rest of it to do code as usual. But if you quit on our side, you also want the client side to know that you are quitting. So we want to put this code here so that we can send quick to the server so that they receive it, they will know it from here the contact server. Same thing from here, so we have data. 
re explain the code a bit because uh, yeah, the audio is very shaky. So, do you all have any questions about this? If not, I will go through the code again. So, like, server.py file, you want to call socket.socket .socket, and then you bind it to a server, which is like local host address and port number 12345. You have a while through loop, so you'll run forever. Uh, then, after that, uh, you will first uh, listen for active sockets, and if there's sockets wanting to con if there's a client wants to connect to you, then you will accept the socket, and then you will get back a chat socket, uh, which is the socket you will use to communicate with the client. Then you will uh, have a quit equals to false. So while the client does not or the server does not want to quit, it will keep running. Then you just have the data equals input, and you will just communicate with the server and client until one of them decides to quit. And yeah. Uh, that's basically it. We will move on to the better ship game now. Yeah. Is it possible to plug the microphone with the record diary? Yeah. Is it possible? Yeah, this is for smaller space uh, things because uh, this server and client right, ultimately on Python, you can only connect from uh, on one, like from one but you in the video soon to okay. uh, So basically, if you want to try running this code on two computers, you can. But the thing is, because Firewall has disabled like uh, connecting directly from port to port, so in real world, you can't actually, uh, it's not actually feasible to connect to another computer using this socket. This is just a demonstration of one computer. So like if you want, uh, but this is like demonstration of what real world sockets are basically you have a client and a server, then you connect with each other uh, on a secure port. Yeah. So basically now uh, there will be a game showcase on Battleship, how you can use sockets to play a game of Battleship between two players. Yeah. Huh? Uh, do you all want to take out your laptops to follow along or just watch? Okay. Battleship. The server will generate a 3 by 3 grid and determine a random location for the ship to be in. The client will then have 3 attempts to guess which row and column the ship is in. We have prepared templates for the server and client program. You can download them at the link shown below. These are the templates. You can pause the video to attempt the challenge. Alright, now I will go through the solution. The three functions here serve different purposes and can be used multiple times in the main program. Integrate creates the game grid while display functions display the grid to the client. Get user input prompts the client for input and receives input from client for both row and column. I made that is uh, kind of relevant to socket, kind of not. You all can go and experiment. Okay, back to the video. Yeah. In get user input, there are four missing lines. All right. So first, we have to send instructions to the client or user to input their role guess. 
then we will have to receive their input and store them in a variable like so. Then we will repeat the process to get column input. Next, we have to create a server socket. First, we have to create a socket using the dot socket function. Secondly, we will bind it to a local host and the port number of our choice. Then, we will allow the socket to listen for incoming connections using dot listen. Lastly, we will use dot accept to allow the socket to accept any connection request and store the new socket in variable called connector socket and address topper in variable called address. However, before we can accept an incoming request, there have to be a request coming from the client side. So now let's switch to the client program. In the client program, we have to create the client socket and connect it to a server socket as such. Back in the server program, these two lines of code is used to generate a random row and column where the ship will exist. We will use a while loop and that loop will loop as long as the number of times guess does not reach 3. It also loop as long as the client has not made a correct guess indicated by the boolean called warn. Inside the while loop, these two variables store the user input. Then, it does a check of whether the guesses are correct. If the guesses are correct, the warn boolean becomes true and the while loop stops. It is good to take note that we increment times guess by 1 every time the client makes a guess. After every guess, we'll be updating and displaying the grid using this code. Lastly, we have to let the user know if he wins or loses. To do this, we will use the send all function under the condition which client won or client lost. Now, let me explain the client program code. Using an infinite while true loop, the client socket will continuously receive data from the server. It receives the code using the dot receive command as such. Once data is received, it prints the decoder data. If enter is detected in the data received, this means that it is prompting the client for an input. Thus, we have to send the in user input back to the server. If you won or you lost is detected, it means the game is over and the while true loop will break. It is a good practice to close the sockets we use. This concludes the online workshop. We hope you have learned something. Thank you.
Okay, so uh, since there's still time, let me go through a game.py that I wrote for this for sure. Yeah. So basically, this game.py, let me open it in IDE. It looks something like this. Basically, when you run it, it's like an RPG game. So this is the map. The C is your character. Dots are nothing spaces. E is the enemy. And T is the treasure which you have to go to. So you can input up, down, left, or right to go. And if you input the wrong thing, well, you will say false move and ask you to try again. Oh, oops. So uh, let me just put down. Let, let me just move down. Down. Yeah, as it, as, OK, so what happens when you meet an enemy, right? So I'm just going to meet an enemy right here. You print out this, and you have two, two options. You either attack, or you run away from this enemy. So let's try attack first. Once you press attack, you print out these stats. And then, so basically from here you can see that your enemy has 15 health, you have 20 health. You attacked it for 7 damage, it has 8 health left. The enemy hit you for 5.5 damage, so you have 14.5 health left. So uh, since it has like 8 health left, let's just attack again. And now he has one health left, but I have 11 health remaining. Let's just attack one more time. And yes, we defeated the enemy. So as we defeat the enemy, the map will get updated and there will be less enemies. So what happens is every seven turns, there will be even, there will be even more enemies updated. Right. I'm just going to go through my game here. Uh, OK, so what happens if you try to run away from the enemy? There's a 50% chance you'll get it. Up. Hey, I ran away. That's good. So let me just keep moving to the treasure. Oh no, there are even more enemies. Scary. So uh, as you can see, the game is not very polished yet because you can just run past all the enemies and you can just reach the treasure. Ta-ta, I win. Right. But, uh, okay, so you might be wondering, how does this relate to socket programming? Yes. This is my answer. Um, so, basically, right, what happens is, you know, these kinds of game, the majority of your game code is actually not stored on your client servers, uh, on your client side, because that might be uh, too heavy on your computer, and you want to have, you want the people to have, uh, yeah, you, you don't want so much code on your client's computer. Lah. So basically, most of this code can be placed on a server, and then the client just need to interact with the server. The server, this is called backend logic. The server will do backend logic and return something to the client. So uh, what if, let's say, you don't want to have so much code on the client side. So let me show you what it might look like. This will be what potentially looks like for a client code for this kind of game. If this will still work or in, conjun in conjunction with a server code, but look here, up from 200 plus lines, it has cut down to 59 lines of code. And the uh, majority of the code is taken up by this enemy sprite, which is really cool. I like it a lot. Uh, yeah, and you can see here, it actually cut down code a lot. And this is how some uh, uh, some games, they basically let you download your client, they download, let you download some client code, but it's not very large, even though the game is very expensive and has lots of functions. That's because most of the back-end logic is actually placed inside the server game.py. So let me just go to the server game.py, you see, whoa, you see so much uh, code again. It's even more code, it's around 300 lines of code. That I wrote myself. Yay. <laughs> uh, so uh what? So basically what did I change from the original code? So first I copy pasted all the code here, but I added import socket. So uh basically for all the code that needed input, uh let's see here. Uh, basically all the code that needed input, let's say uh you have to input up, down, left, or right inside the move function. It, it, right. This is all. This is all changed because I added a. Uh, uh, 
where is it? Hang on, let me let me try five. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Uh, you can see here. Instead of just asking for input, calling the Python input function, uh, where do you want to go? Left, up, down, left, right. Instead, I send this over to the client where you receive it. Uh, the client again. Yeah. So basically, I added a special thing here called input at the front of the lead, at the front of the uh, string, and then every time there is input inside the string, then it will ask the client to input the data so it can send send it over to the server. Basically, the server only um, and uh, for the stuff that the server prints out, it will just send it over to the client where the client will print out the uh, everything. So let's try running this game first. When the client connects to the server, the server will generate a map and then that time you print here. And you can see that there's, uh, there's uh, reinforcement things. We'll look at this later. Uh, so basically, you want to go right. It goes right, right. Basically, these functions just as a normal game, except that the client code is so much more smaller. So you can actually, con uh, you don't have to write so much code and the client won't have to spend so much time downloading it. So you, you, as you can see, right, right. I'm always right. Nah, I'm joking. Uh, yeah, see, it is always the same. Then you can attack. Attack. Oh no, am I dying? Oh no, I have 8.5 health remaining. Enemy has 7 health. Okay, so yeah, this here is a problem of uh, me not adding slash n. It's okay, I'll do that later. I will attack. Oh no, I have, four, I have four health left. But the enemy also have four health. So, uh, YOLO. Yes, I defeated enemy. Oh yeah, and I'll show you what happens if you actually get defeated by the enemy. That's the only way you can fail this game. Oh, okay, so basically here, uh, I Basically here, I thought that if you have a game code and you have the server and client code, but it will be very boring for the server side to just watch the client play game. So uh, what I added is reinforcements. So basically, every seven uh, every seven turns, the server can choose whether they want to send reinforcements, basically add more enemies, or they can don't do that. Uh, this will essentially like add an uh, element of strategy for the server side even though it's a bit, it's still an element of strategy like for example if you see that the character is like oh uh, you want to save your reinforcements perhaps then you can type n and then uh, you you can don't send in your reinforcements and the character can choose where to go if you decide to send in reinforcements then uh, the character will be suddenly swarmed with enemies and yeah, it might be unexpected for them lah. So since my characters on one health, let's just die anyways. Wait, no, I one shot the enemy. Cool. Okay, so so basically, every time you get the same reinforcements, maybe this time I like, oh, I want to kill this character already. So boring. Then I send yeah why? Then immediately the map gets updated, and there's suddenly so much more enemies for me to suicide in. Okay, so let me just die again. Oh, never mind. The enemy hit me for 0 0.5 damage. The enemy is so weak. Yeah, by the way, the enemy generation is all random. And oh, my character is so OP. Defeated another enemy. <laughs> I feel like I can just start a gaming stream right now. Uh, let's just die I have 1.5 health left oh then my look here the enemy hit me for zero damage why am I so lucky at the wrong time okay hey I defeated the enemy let's <laughs> try again oh shit I defeated another okay yeah, okay so 
you can send in reinforcements again. I want to do so so I can kill myself. Yeah, so basically this game lacks quite a lot of functions like items, like XP, stuff you will find normally in RPG. But this is just a proof of concept that a large chunk of code can actually be uh, uh, lessened. So you can actually have the client. Oh, I finally died. See, game over. So basically the client code does not have to download as much code on their site to be able to play the game. For do so basically let's look at the code again. The only reason why Sprite is here is because you cannot uh, send this over socket because the socket does not allow you to encode this. So there will be some stuff that you cannot send over socket or there will be some stuff where if you put in the socket, uh, if you put on the back end, then you'll be too slow, like some games need reaction time. So a lot of uh, stuff of this stuff still has to be on client side. But generally, the logic behind the game can all be condensed. And so, yeah, socket basically made the code shorter for uh, the client to download. Since we have more time, let me just go through what I've been doing for this game. So, I have a map, uh, map class here. So when you initialize the when I initialize the map class, where uh, which I do here, MP equals to M map. So when I initialize, it will call a random integer anywhere from one to eighteen. Uh, that is because the first and the last ones uh, of the list will always have to be the walls, like as you can see here. Wait. Uh, as you can see. Yeah, the first and the last lines will always be these walls and you can't literally you can't go into it. So for this I use a generation random generation. I made it such that I use a 2D array basically. So and I use a nested for loop. So for 20 times I will create each line of this and I make sure that only on the 13th line and then j equals to any random number, then there will be a treasure. So the treasure will always be on the 13th line, but the number will be random. Then, else right, I will just have a random from 1 to 10. Like, basically there's 10% possibility that an enemy will be on that space. And then, else if, there, if, it didn't, if it's not a treasure spot or if it's not an enemy stop, you'll just append a dot. Then this will run for 18 times and then you will finally append back uh, of the wall and then this will the self.map will append this list. So basically self.map is a list of 20 lists uh, which is a 2D matrix of this entire map. I hope that's not a bit that, that's a bit too complicated because this is deviating from socket and going into object oriented programming but sometimes this Python uh, yeah, these Python concepts mesh together to create something. Uh. So you will have to understand this. So I just have then I have some basic functions like get map and change map. Like I want, if I want to change this particular location uh, from enemy, let's say the enemy is defeated, so now it will become dot. And then uh, here's the show function. I basically use some if loops uh, in one statement because to make it neater. Right, of course this is same as me just writing uh, if. Yeah, this is same as me just writing if ha x bigger than zero. Oops. So basically this code is the same as this code except that I write it all in one line because for large scale projects like this I want to I want people to understand the code uh, but uh, not like have it too long. 
So this is equal to this. And I just realized that that was a contradiction because I should also add comments and documentation, which I didn't have time to add in. But if I did, uh, then it will be yeah, uh, it will be easier to understand. Uh, yeah, adding documentation in your code is really important because if not, you won't have uh, people won't understand what you are writing, and you have to explain to them, which wastes a lot of time. So for this show function, I basically just have a nested for loop, and then if and then I check back with the self dot map function, and then after that I will just print it like this. And then show map is the same thing, but show map is the same thing, but it's just a smaller map because if you input the whole map every time, it is unnecessary and it takes a longer time. So I just have it around uh, the character, five, space, uh, five spaces around the character, it will show the map. Then this is the enemy encounter one, basically if there is enemy encounter, it will return true, else it will return false. Same thing for a treasure encounter. And then this is the add enemy. So basically you'll run the enemy generation code again uh, to add reinforcements. Yeah. So getting to the enemy one, where you initialize, there will be a random variable difficulty. And the difficulty will set the health and the attack. Which can uh, so what happens is if there's uh, every time uh, look at this code, every time there is an uh, enemy, right, then you will call dot add enemy. Wait, no, no, not this code. Uh, it's no, it's in the move function, yes. So if MP dot enemy encounter equals to true. It will print fighting enemy. Then it will create a random integer of one to four. Then you will print all the enemy sprites. You will print all the attack and all the attack and stuff. Then after that, you will call the enemy dot attack. So oh my god. Hmm. I need water. Uh, so basically these codes are just like Oh no, do I, do I explain everything? I just like I said, okay uh, The most important function here is the move function Because that's where everything happens, all the checks happen So if you are wondering how they code games, here you go, this is how you code games Basically, uh, every movement you make, firstly, this is just to make sure that you are inputting up, down, left, or right, else you will just uh, put no thank you, uh, we want a right input. So for here, right, every time you uh, a game runs, right, you will check if you first get a treasure, if not, you will check if you first have enemy, if really you don't have, then you will just move you. So uh, basically games are like that too in real life. They will every time you do something, they will conduct a check to make sure it, uh, any environment or variables have been moved. If they have, then they will accurately show it in game. So uh, for the uh, treasure encounter one, it's just print you found the treasure you win and then return false. This is to signal the code to stop the stop running the loop. I like okay. I feel we are holding a mic when there's no one to talk to. This one? Speak louder? In that case, I'll get some water. Hang on.
Test, test, one, okay. Hi. So I use the mic from now on. Okay. Where was I? Um. So. So how? Uh. Okay. So, for enemy generation, when there's an enemy encountered which means the MP dot enemy encounter returns true, then you'll print fighting enemy, and then uh, you'll send over fighting enemy through the socket. This is just a way of printing things. Uh. Then you'll generate a random enemy. So while this is, while true is, that means like while the enemy is still alive, then you will print the sprite, and you'll send the sprite over. Then after that, you will print uh, the options you have, and then you can input either one or two. Then uh, you will receive the a message from the uh, client, uh, and then basically, if it's not one or not two, it will ask you to go again. If it is, if it uh, this is a while loop, so you'll keep running this until the client sends out one or two. So uh, if if it if it does send a one or two, then you print out the status, you print out your health, and then after that, if it's one, then you will attack. And you see here, my attack generation is basically using a base attack. Then there's a plus minus from negative three to three. So basically, your attack range will be anywhere from negative three to three. Then you'll hit the enemy for this amount of damage. Then you'll print how much you attack for. Then after that, your enemy, if enemy is, uh, the health is greater than zero, then uh, it's smaller than zero, then you'll print enemy defeated and you'll stop running the code because it, a, de a dead enemy can't attack you. So it, uh, you run the same thing if A is equal to two. If uh, then you have a 50% chance of running away. This is just my random generation code. Uh, I have one here, and then I, have, I call random dot ran in one or two. So there's a 50% chance it will be one, 50% chance there will be two. So if it's the 50% chance there is one, then you'll print run away successfully and you'll stop running. Else, right, you will print fail to run away. So why, uh, why did I add the enemy dot attack code yet? Because uh, the thing is, if you fail to run away, the enemy will get a free hit on you. And then if you didn't defeat the enemy, the enemy will also get a hit on you. So since those two outcomes are the same, you don't need to write the enemy attack code twice. You just need to write it after the if loop, which is here. So because they both send, uh, share the same outcome, so if they don't break, then they will have to uh, get damaged by the enemy. So for the damage, I call enemy dot damage function. If you go up here, the dot damage function is just the same thing: self attack and then plus minus three. Then uh, you damage yourself self dot health minus equals damage, and if it's smaller than zero, smaller of equals to zero, you print you have been killed, and then. This time dot sleep here is to ensure that the people have time to actually read what you send before they repeating the while loop. And because when you repeat the while loop, you will print the sprite. 
as you see here, this notorious sprite. So you take out the whole screen, so you can't like read this uh code again. So I will print uh let it sleep for like two seconds, so you can actually read the code before it moves on. And then, yeah, once uh, basically once it has been defeated, this loop will break, and then so you will change uh change map from uh this is the position of your character so basically if your character is on this position um and and then you meet an enemy then you defeat the enemy or run away from the enemy then the enemy uh will be changed from a e to a dot so the enemy won't appear again then you can continue on your merry way to call the move function again So, yeah, then these codes are pretty typical of socket programming. You call the socket.socket, .socket, you bind it, and then you listen for active connections. And so, like this, I just, you print out, like, the menu. Like, yeah, then after that, you have a while through loop that keeps running until the person dies. Basically, this is the reinforcement code. And then, this is the charge code. This is basically like, uh, you can choose whether to send reinforcements or don't send reinforcements. And then, for here, it's just the same movement code. They ask you to uh, send in uh, up, down, left, right. Then after that, it will call into the function dot move, and then if if not if it return if this boolean function returns false, it means that uh, the character has died uh, from our earlier part of the code. So it will print out game over, and then it will break the function. Else, it will keep running this code. Um, for those that uh, just join in, we are looking at this game code using socket programming. So basically, I'm demonstrating that even such a huge chunk of back-end code can be simplified using socket if... Uh, uh, wait, no, this is the shell. Let me just close the shell. So basically, uh, the original code looks something like this. So this is the game code, and it's, it looks very long, it looks very tedious, and then if you are bringing it up on industry level standards, it, it will be even longer, and it will be probably a few gigabytes, if not a terabyte of code to work with. So, uh, but if you, are, if you want a game to work, you want your client to uh, download the least amount of um, bytes possible for your code to run. So basically, utilizing socket, I cut down on the number of code the client has from around 300 lines to just 50 lines. So they only need to download 50 lines of code, but of course, you have to connect to the server where the server will have about 300 lines of code, but it doesn't matter because the server is on your side. And so the you by doing this, you cut down on the uh, basic requirements that a client need to have uh, to run a game. Yeah, so for the game side, right, uh, it's not that there won't be any code. There'll be some code uh, that can't be sent over through socket. Like for example, in my example, this sprite or enemy sprite, it can't be sent over through socket because it can't be encoded. And then there's also some stuff that, um, let's say, like your game is ask for reflexes. So if you send it from server to client and your internet speed is especially slow, it might not uh, be so good for like those kind of games. So there are some games that still has to be written in the front end, but mostly games operate by putting more majority of their code in the back end so the client doesn't need to uh, do so much with it. So basically for back end code, it looks similar to all the a code, it just receives the data, but I have this, this part here. So basically, if the server wants you to input something, you put input inside the data that you receive. So uh, if the input, uh, while 
input not in data. So that means it will keep receiving data until uh, input not in data. So if the data uh, sent by the server is sprite, that means the server wants us to print the sprite. So we'll print a sprite. If the data equals to game over, then we will know that the game is over, then we'll close the client socket. If not, we'll print the data. So basically, this will print data continuously until we receive something from the server that has input in it. Once we do, we'll quit out the uh, we'll quit out this loop since input is not in data. So we'll stop running the loop. Then we'll ask the client to input the data, and then after that, you can uh, send the data back over to the server. Then after that, you will repeat this while through loop again. So basically, you'll keep. Uh, receiving uh, inputs from the server. So uh, for those that come in, uh, you all haven't seen how the game runs, so let me just show you. You run the server code first, then you run the client code. The server will generate a map, a, a random map, and then you will send to the client. Then the client can input, re the, for reference, this is the map. These are the walls, These, uh, the dots are nothing, E is the enemy, and C is your character. And you want to go to T, a randomly generated treasure uh, point, so like uh, you can win the game. So you can input left, you can go left, but you can't because left beside it is like a gate, uh, it's like the wall, so you can input right. And then you update the map and your C will move right. You can move right again, oh. but you have to spell right correctly. It's harder to type with one hand, I've realized. Uh, then you can go down and down, and this is the enemy attack sequence. One bigger, okay. Uh, no, I'm not making it comic sense, but I will make the form bigger. How does it look? Oh, oh no. But my game now will be too big. Never mind. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, basically, uh, you have two options when you come into a character. You can either attack or run. And these are code that I just explained just now, so I won't go too deep. But basically, we can attack and see. Uh, it will deal out random damage based on uh, random generator that I made. That's not so random because uh, we still want, uh, yeah, we still want to have like a base attack. So, okay. Um, so basically, every time an enemy gets defeated, the enemy on the map will disappear. Okay, so as I was writing this code, I thought, oh, maybe the people on the server side is not having fun. What if this is why you want this to be a two-player game, like the battleship game? So like why what, what if this side is very boring? So I added this reinforcements. So as you go about uh defeating enemies on your server side, there will be Mm, lesser and lesser enemies. Look at this map. There's only one enemy be beside me, and I can just easily avoid it. So, like, where's the challenge in this game now? So, like, for here, right, then you will... So, every time you... There will be a countdown timer on the server side that the client does not know of, then every time it reaches zero, you can choose to send uh, reinforcements. So, let me demonstrate by typing yes. Then suddenly, whoa, your map just added so much more enemies. Okay, so this adds a strategic element to the game on the uh, server side also, because the server side can choose whether they want to send it or maybe they can hold it off so they can send like two or three reinforcements at the same time and just overwhelm the character. Uh, this can, uh, yeah, this adds like an uh, element of strategy and like two, uh, and the server won't be actually be bought because. Without this code, the server is just watching the client play and not playing themselves. Obviously, in uh, industry standard, 
uh, the server doesn't have to do anything. It's all up to the client. But since this is just uh, on my local address, I wanted to have some fun, so I just added this. Honestly, this uh, code is still lacking a lot of things, and it can be barely be considered a game. But uh, uh, this is just a proof of concept that you can actually diminish all the code from server. Uh, like if uh, you have, if you have like so much base code for the game, you can just not you don't have to let the client download everything. Uh, so now I'll just win the game because I explain around everything there is then oops. hang on I need to type Okay, so I killed, uh, I've been killed by the enemy, so now I ended the game, and yes, I, I think that's it for my game showcase, there is nothing else, uh, any questions, yeah? Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah, basically. Uh, yeah, this is direct connection to the computer, which is why uh, the firewall actually blocks any like outside connections on the port. But this is a simulation of uh, internet sockets. Yeah. Uh, are there any more questions? All this code can be found on my GitHub page. Uh, let me shamelessly park my big GitHub page here. So basically, you can go to this website. You can find all the uh, socket programming uh, workshop materials, including all the code that we have just mentioned. So maybe like if you are interested uh, in uh, learning socket programming, you can copy paste some code here as like your base to start you off doing socket programming. Yeah. Mm, are there any other questions? If not, I think. Yes. Uh, basically, every computer, if you want to connect to the internet, it has sockets. Uh, let me show you. Uh, let me go to my command prompt. I can go to netstat. Uh, wait, no. What, what's the exact command? Uh, so basically, if you go, yeah, it will show all the ports. And then you'll see, you can see it's connected to like, YouTube, got like all the Firefox stuff. Basically, if you want to connect to the internet, you will have to connect it using ports. Let me just dash in. Okay, so basically these are all the ports here. Uh, you can see 127.0.0.1, this is local host. These are all the local host ports that I have running. And then these are all the external ports, which means like all the website that I'm connected to. And then, uh, uh, so you see, this is. So what you're saying is every yeah, basically. Every yeah, if you want to connect and, and transmit data, you have to do it using sockets. Yeah, and then you, you can see here all how all the port numbers, which are the thing behind uh, the address, these port numbers, they're all unique. That's because no two uh, sockets can connect to the same port at the same time. So uh, yeah, your computer has a lot of ports, 65,000 to be sure, so that you can connect to a lot, a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, so if there are no further questions, I think we can end this
uh, talk. Right. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, uh, kind attention and see you soon at 4CR. Yeah. <laughs>